Hello, this is One Mana Left. I've done a couple videos this week getting into the start of 324 that are, let's call them League Starter Builds. This is what everyone's doing right now, this is what everyone wants. We're getting ready to wash up on the beach with new characters. And everyone's gonna have a trash can character, so everyone wants League Starters. So I've done my last couple videos targeted at that mindset of having an early game League Start character. If you look particularly at my globes here, and the fact that I'm at Delve 5,238 at a boss that has HP cap of 2 billion, what I'm going to show you today is not a League Starter build. I repeat. This is not a League Starter build. So, if you're here looking for what you can play on Friday as your League Starter, or if this is your maybe your first League in Path of Exile, run away. You do not belong here. Because what I'm going to show you right now is an endgame build. So, this is Mana Forged Arrows. It will be the strongest build in the game in 324 uh it's just not even close it does billions of dps and it's insanely tanky so i'll talk later i've had some criticism lately that i'm not doing enough fighting i'm doing too much talking to start a video so why don't i just show you some damage first and then uh there's the damage so this guy's got hp cap two billion that's actually probably pretty poor ramp but I'll do a little demo here. Oh, why do I not have darkness res? Or why do I have flares? Almost had a. Do I have flares? I do this every time, don't I? I do a delve demo and I don't have flares. I almost died of darkness. Clearly, I just need to get up to depth 27,389 like Rudy so that I don't take damage from darkness because it's integer overflow. But. I don't know. As you can kind of see right here, uh, I'm kind of covering the entire screen. That's cool. Uh, and when this boss comes back out, you're going to see him die. I'm going to try to mouse over his HP. And go. No, that was a terrible bird. Okay, well, I got screwed there, but that could have been a better demo. All right. This is Mana Forge Arrows. Alright, I'm in standard right now. I have a goofy character. This is a super end game. But I'm going to take you through how the build works, why it's the best build in the game, and I have a POB for a, a pre-Mage Blood, pre-Crit Jewel setup that is probably going to be like my two-week target. And it's probably going to be in like the two to three hundred Divine Ballpark, but... That should be pretty farmable in two to three weeks. So, uh, let's look at some mechanics. So, Mana Forged Arrows, if you're not familiar, um, it has a 200 multiplier, and it says after you spend 300% of this skill's cost on other skills, it will trigger the socketed skill. So, what you're doing in this build is you're having a spender... That's spending mana. As that spender spends mana, it triggers this triggered skill. And in my scenario, I have a second link because they're not uh, internal cooldown between them. That has two other skills. So the configuration I have is weapon is spender, and that's important. It has to be your spender has to be your weapon. Chest is the main nuke. That's all the damage, and that's storm rain. Because it's the most efficient damage per arrow you can get. And then I have an extra Mana Forge link that has... Um, it's targeted at just kind of utility and Mana Leech. So I have Mana Leech support. I have Mana Forged Arrows here. And then I have Rain of Arrows Saturation. And in this case, I'm using Blast Strain because I have Min Frenzy Charges. But normally you'd use Frenzy um, to generate Frenzy Charges. But, okay. So how it works normally is this spends and these trigger now they don't trigger at the same rate because it's based off the base cost of the skills so for example um my four link will spend every two to three shots 
It should be every two in reality, but when I'm in hideout because of rounding at low cost, it's every three. Uh, but in actual gameplay, it'll be every two. Uh, and then my chest has a lot more links to it. So it will spend every six. So however much I fire this off, you'll notice I have some storm rains going out on the ground. And I should have some blast rains going down. And this, you'll notice, shoots a lot of arrows. So the important line of text on this gem is the fact that it says supported skills deal 1% more damage with hits and ailments per 1% mana cost. So the objective is to get the mana cost higher. How do you do that? Well, uh, if this is your introduction to mana builds uh, and you don't know the answer to this, hello, I'm your professor today, and uh, this is called Indigon. This is how you play mana builds. So Indigon is typically a spell item. That's like the intent of the item. But it makes everything more expensive. So as you spend mana and you spend more mana, it gives you a cost increase multiplier. So we start the loop with an arcane cloak. So this spends, in my case, 23,400 mana. That immediately gives me a bunch of cost multiplier. So instead of having a spender that costs 13 mana, it immediately jumps into a spender that costs 1,000 mana. But um, as I spend more, the cost keeps going higher and higher and higher and higher until these things start to cost like 20,000. Well, the cool thing is, if this costs 20,000, uh, that means it has a multiplier where it does 200 times damage. So, you can kind of see now why, uh, why this build can do billions of DPS. But the tricky part is sustaining that much mana. The way you sustain that much mana is instant leech. So, typically what you're going to do is you're going to have a, the leech mastery up here. Uh, maybe there will be a source of instant leech somewhere else. Like last league, we had uh, that which was taken. So this ended up being my source of instant leech. But the way I played it last league in Tota, and the way I will, I guess, plan to play it going forward next league is the leech mastery still. So this is really good for two reasons. Because the first is it makes your energy shield leech from lightning damage from storm drinker instant. Um... And then it makes your mana leech instant as well. So this is very, very powerful. Because um, notice how many hits I'm doing. This is why I'm using a skill that says it fires 55 arrows. And half of them land on a target if possible. So I have 250 arrows per second for my spender. I have 100 plus arrows per second for my second link, probably 150. And then probably close to 100 hits per second from b both my Mirage Archer and my main nuke. So I'm doing like 500 hits per second. That's like the whole point of the build. That's why we use skills that other ranged characters don't necessarily use because we're prioritizing number of hits over the raw damage of the spender hits. Because the number of hits dictates how much recovery you have for mana and energy shield so one of those things makes you immortal and the other one makes you do like infinite damage this is a really broken combo and this is the whole basis of the build uh so it's a pretty simple loop when you lay it out that way though i know there's a lot going on a lot to follow but the long story short is you jack your mana cost up with indigon and then you have instant attack leech from your attacks that pretty much full infinite restores your mana to full every single shot every single fraction of a second while also doing the same to your energy shield to make you really tanky. And that just jacks your cost up to the point where you start getting such a crazy more multiply on your mana forged arrow. That it just does like billions of damage. So it's a pretty good clear skill. I mean it's you can you can it's it's versatile in a couple of ways because it's not bound to a specific skill. Like for some reasons the rain of arrow saturation is what uh, is good right now for this. But like you can switch this to lightning arrow. When I played this in Tota, I mainly mapped as Lightning Arrow and is really comfortable because the thing is you don't need billions of damage for mapping. So even though my Lightning, like the Spender you have doesn't get the Mana Forge Arrow Multiplier, but it does get a lot of other sources of damage. So you might do like 10 mil DPS on your Spender, which for things like Deep Delve and Valdo's maps is insignificant compared to your Big Nuke doing billions. But for like just Tier 16 mapping, it's amazing. You just blow up the entire screen. You just point... And then, oh look, I'm a lightning arrow character like everyone else is going to be this league. 
and I just blow up two screens in one shot. So it's a very good mapping character just because you're a bow guy, all right? It's hard to be a bow guy and not be a good mapping character. But the places that bow guys tend to struggle is like big single target damage and tankiness. And, well, this build gets those things in excess. So for all of these reasons, this will be by far the strongest build in the game. Just, just from a numbers standpoint, and it's still pretty smooth as well. There is one clunky part to it, though. Um, and that's how you get your percent damage. So the way this build used to play was you got your percent damage from Anomalous Mana Leech, which gave you 10 or with quality 11% uh, increased attack damage. Well, yeah, attack damage per 200 mana spent recently. So this could give you like 10,000% increased damage. That's really powerful. The thing is, you still get spell damage from Indigon by being at all that spend. So you still get 2,000% spell damage. The way you do that with this build is you have a Red Blade Banner on your swap. And then you have Ur uh, Battle Mage's Cry with increased duration. So if you see here, I will have a Battle Mage's Cry buff that lasts 11 seconds. The thing is, this persists through your weapon swap. This, this stays. So... Watch this illustration here if you don't believe me. All right. So technically this will, well, it would include my flat damage. But if I, if I cloak here, my tooltip's 182k. So that's just from the flat damage of cloak. But watch what happens when I weapon swap. Then I battle mages cry. Then I swap back. Now I'll cloak. Now what's my tooltip? 2.1 million. Uh, so 12 times higher. Why? Because I just gained like 5,000% damage. Because at max stacks, you get 2,000% um, from Indigon. And then you get 1.5 times from Battle Mage's Cry. And this buff scales the Warcry effect. So you get 25 Warcry effect on the Claw. Um, you can get Watcher's Eye mods. There's a certain combo here that has 32%. And then in the Adorn Tree I'm going to make, you actually take these for 41%. You can also get up to like 17% on a boot implicit with the eater implicit. So you can pretty, not easily, but you can scale that buff effect up to like 92% with just like a Watcher's Eye or a, a Lethal Pride. Maybe these points down here, maybe one or the other, and then 25 in the claw and like 17 on boots. So if, if that if that's taken times one po or 192%, that buff actually is giving you like 6,000% damage. Um, so that kind of makes you go from doing crazy damage to just like unreasonable damage. But that is the one clunky part. Maybe, like I said, for tier 16 mapping, you don't need it. But if you're actually doing insane hard content, like, uh, really Ubers would be like the bare minimum. It'd probably be things more like Deep Delve and Valdos, or like maybe we'll have things this league with tier 17 maps. But, um, to get the damage past like the 100 mil mark into the billions you the, the skill basically plays that every you know 12 seconds you're firing it sounds clunky but after you play it for a little bit at least i got used to it but you're you're shooting you swap you battle mages cry you swap back you're back to shooting the buff lasts for 12 seconds well 11 seconds in my case but in the in the tree i have here since i'm taking this wheel these give some war cry effect uh, or some duration so it actually is a little nice um, because it makes the buff last like 13.3 seconds then. So it's a little bit of quality of life. Uh, the other thing to note there is uh, this coming league in 324, we're getting a new support called Call to Arms. So that, in this case, would replace Urgent Orders. Uh, and Call to Arms, we might need clarification on how this works. I can't speak to this right now. I'll maybe make an update to this later. But... The way the gem reads is it's an activated spell that after you activate it makes it use any war, war cries on cooldown instantly. So I don't think this buff will persist through weapon swap. So I think you'll still need to do um, a swap and then use the skill, which will then instantly use the war cry and then swap back, which is still nicer because right now my war cry time is 0.37 seconds. Which I've kind of gotten used to. You know, you have this 0.37 second war cry and then you go back. But with that, it should be actually instant. So it should, instead of just being swap, war cry, swap, 
It should be you, the time should be pretty dang like swap swap, uh, and then it's thirteen second buff. If you hate playing a build that has to do a, a double weapon swap every thirteen seconds, I guess you can play a weaker build. It's fine, but um, you kind of socket started on the front gems, so it's not really an option to put in your front gems unless you give up your four link down here. But uh, if you go this route, you will do more damage than you will ever need. So, as far as why this isn't a starter build, there's a couple boxes that you need to check just to make everything work. Uh, because you need to get your spend to be a positive feedback loop, which what, what that means is Indigon stacks fade every four seconds. So if your attack speed is low enough, you won't get a positive feedback loop. You will you will lose Indigon stacks slowly. It's a little. I have a video on this called like Indigon mechanics or something from a while ago that explains this a little better if you want to go more in depth. But long story short is your mana ramp is basically an exponential loop and differences in attack speed are basically the difference between that exponent being like 1.1 or 0.9 where you're either going to ramp to infinity or you're going to decay to zero um, and if you have a lowish amount of attack speed you're going to decay to zero if you have above like three aps you're going to go to positive, which, you know, there's things you can do to help that, like this unnatural instinct, which is giving me 13 attack speed plus Harrier's 21 attack speed. You know, there, there, there's a couple other, you know, the frenzy chargers give you some attack speed. The action speed on boots can give you attack speed. You need a bare minimum amount of attack speed, though, to get to that positive feedback loop. And you might find yourself having a better time with a 60% Indigon. But you can, with maybe insane gear, a favor a lower Indigon, like a 50 or 55 but the lower gear you have, the more you're going to want a 60. But that makes like a minimum gear requirement for this build to get to that point. Um, and it scales super hard with mana. More so than even like Mjolnir. Uh, because your multiplier goes beyond Ingon stacks. There's no cap on the Mana Forge Era multiplier. Um, and then there's your weapon situation is a little bit expensive. Like a Mjolnir setup, you're pretty much only having to buy like a Mjolnir and a Prism Garden to get it going. Where this setup tends to favor using a Widow Hail and a Rare Quiver. But getting like a, a like a like a rare quiver because you have so much scaling off that rare quiver, um, getting a passable one that gives you like these insane stats is gonna cost you like double digit divines. Cause you really wanna have plus one arrow, because that's plus three arrows. And since Storm Rain only fires run one arrow, um, Going from one arrow to four is understandably a big deal for your damage. It's literally four times damage. So, like, you know, your your plus one arrow really, really matters. Uh, just all stats on here are taken times three and a half times. Like, it, it's such a huge multiplier on damage. Like, if I were to look at this tooltip, like, obviously this tooltip doesn't really matter, but, like, 14k here versus... Oh, does this even show? Do I have to play, in, do I have to play Tetris in my inventory to see this? DPS, 93. Okay, well, I have a lot of stats on Quiver. 14k. But yeah, all your stats come from Quiver, so you really need to go all in on Quiver. Um, but fortunately, I made a tree here that... This is actually going to be my first setup that's using an Adorned. Uh, so let's go over this tree. So, yes, this is 100 character on this tree, but, um, I mean, ultimately, you could drop it down to a 96 character. The reason I made it 100 characters is because, like I said, I think this setup to make what this tree is is probably going to be two to 300 divines. I think most people are going to be 100 by the time they have two to 300 divines at, like, the two-week mark. At least that's how I am. If you die a lot or you farm a magic find setup or something that, like, you, you just aren't getting XP... I don't know. If you're 96, you're going to, like, drop a socket or something, whatever. Or maybe you get crit jewels and drop two points here with LA Overload. But this is a non-crit setup I just made for 100, and it's... 1.6 billion DPS, assuming a generous one mana globe per second. You can double that pretty easily. I've I've gotten as high as like 550k with this much mana, which sounds silly, but it it tr it, it it goes really high. But I'm gonna be generous here and say you're spending your whole mana pool every second. But if you go back and watch that delve clip, I'm doing my whole mana pool multiple times per second. Um. So. It's 1.6 billion DPS right now without crit. Without crit. No crit jewels. If I switch to crit jewels, it goes to over 3 billion. Um, but let's let's go through the tree and the items. So in this tree, I'm basically just like a four large cluster Andy. 
And I'm not using, like, voices, because this is, like, roll your eyes all you want. This is budget adorned. Um, so this is just using, like, you know, like, large cluster jewels that are just eight points with two sockets. Um, I will say something that's wrong in this one that I need to update is I don't have my attack large cluster. There's an attack one that has a um, fuel the fight, which is 0.4% of damage leached as uh, mana, of attack damage leached as mana. That's an okay one to have one of because you don't want to put mana leech in your six link because both mana multiplier and a support gem is a lot of damage. Um, so, But then you're not getting leeches from that. So it's a little bit extra mana leech if you can get like a fuel the fight or a daring ideas on one of your clusters or maybe a megalomaniac or somewhere or maybe you anoint uh spirit void or essence sap there's a couple options but there, it's not mandatory it might just feel slightly more smooth on single target on like a really long fight which really shouldn't exist but basically this setup is using four larges um that just have you know t eight points two sockets this one is using a storm drinker setup one time you want one storm drinker because lightning leech ZS is super strong and then i am using an adorned um wherever it may be so i have a 140 adorned here these are gonna be expensive you, you don't need a 150 but i put in a 140 truthfully like a 120 would get this going pretty good but i picked a 140 and all of my jewels are plain Jane. They have no implicits, no corrupt implicits, no synth implicits. The reality is you'd have some implicits that are giving you like different ailment immunities because, you know, if you have like 25% shock reduction with a door and that's like 60% shock reduction, like two of the, like I did a jewel crafting session the other night where I crafted 13 jewels in two hours and six, five or six of them had implicits. And from those implicits of me, of me double corrupting them all, I got Ignite and Shock Immunity. <laughs> and, like, some ailment effect and stuff. So, regardless, though, I'm just using Plain Jade on all these. Just Alteration Orb on either a Fracture or a Plain Jewel. And then Corrupting them or Double Corrupting them. But I don't have any implicits in this tree. I just have this Jewel every time. Um, this is pretty achievable. For like, like I said, if this is, if this is like 30 div on the second weekend and these all cost you like one to five div a piece and there's like 12 of them, that's not that bad. And then I'm using just like a high ish percentage widow hail, which is going to be a couple divines. I don't have a corrupt implicit though. And then I crafted this broadhead arrow quiver, which is pretty much just like if you buy one with a fracture plus one arrow for like 15 divines or something and then spend like 10 div crafting it you can end up with something like this. Uh, the rest of the gear is what I had on my week two Mjolnir character last league. So it's just self-crafted rare items with like some items I bought on trade site. Um, I don't need this res, mod, res efficiency mod because I'm going Dread Banner right now. And I just am using like level 15 clarity. So if I just use level one clarity and got rid of that, I'd have, you know, much more. I don't, I don't, I don't actually need that mod at all. It's just left over there. Um, I have a three rat. It's a good three rat, but, and then some hollow fossil boots. I have a video on how to do these. Uh, I, I technically have, I should get rid of my, uh, helm enchant actually. Now that I think about it, this is left over from trial of the ancestors league. Like I said, um, let me get rid of the helm enchant. So I have just a, a technically it's one implicit. I have just a single crap with shock effect just cause that's that what, what I had on my helmet. All right, so 1.3. All right. Um, I'll link this tree. You don't need to go adorned. Um, there's a couple different setups, but this is also a pre-Mage Blood adorned. I just have a couple of those jewels that have um, Strength Int, but you can use Pure Int or All Attributes as well. And then the fourth modifier is I just have like three of these with 10 All Res, which gives 24 All Res. So then with, with like four of these, that's that's 96 all res. So I'm doing this pre-mage blood. Like this is, I, I said very clearly at the start, this is not a starter build, but I think this is like super manageable for first two weeks. 
if you somewhat know how to farm currency. I'm not even the craziest early league player. Like, not at all. I'm, uh... I take nine hours to kill Kitava. I work full time. I'll take I'll, I'll take one day off on league launch. I'm not I'm not quite like the father of of 14 that can't play the game ever. But I mean, you know, I'll be putting in like half the hours of a lot of people, and I'll still get to this in the first two weeks. So all the builds I'm gonna play, whatever I touch this league with Mjolnir, it's eventually gonna get to this setup. Uh, I will talk briefly on alternate setups for this. So I did some experimenting on a Juggernaut setup um it looked good on paper but ultimately it died due to not having sanctuary of thought uh so this is maybe a good illustration that it has to be either a hierophant or inquisitor with sanctuary of thought because the 50 percent less multiplier is such a big deal when i talked earlier about that feedback loop having like the difference between a power of 1.1 and 0.9 like you know if every multiplier is one second like if you take 1.1 to the 20th power it goes to 7. But if you take 0.9 to the 20th power, it goes to, you know, like the difference between those two numbers. Oops. Like the difference between those two numbers is like 67 times after 20 iterations. Like the diverging spend loops with even like a 1.1 versus 0.9 multiplier difference. Imagine that with a double difference. So like that's how rapidly the spend will diverge. And... The jug looked good on paper. It used the idea of using an ivory tower with divine flesh to effectively get 75% mind over matter. Um, but it didn't work because while it felt good and everything it should be, like 30% of the time, I had a couple clips where I like, you know, one shot a shaper and like I had times where I felt tanky. But ultimately what ended up happening is I kept, um, I kept going two out of mana because the multiplier is just too unreasonable to keep up with. Like, no amount of leech can fix it. So I would just completely bottom out on mana, and then my 75% mind over matter just isn't working. So I'm effectively taking four times damage, and I'm doing zero damage. Because if I don't have mana, I obviously can't do damage. So whatever it was looking like in POB or during that, like, 30% of the time where it was functioning good... The other 70% of the time is doing, like, 99% less damage and taking four times damage... So I ended up scrapping the idea. I think it was worth testing because I learned some things that I can apply to the Hierophant setup. But um, I also am going to maybe experiment with something. This is a really endgame POB. Very few people are going to dabble with this, but I just did this for fun. This is a pub i don't even have the offense plugged in because the uh, the damage is just yes there's no point calculating it um but i have six hundred and four thousand armor with transcendence so i might try this setup for ghosted feared volvo's maps because i can i can be very tanky with this setup like i can tank the double at zero evolve flame blast and she'll knock me down to like 70 percent uh, I even have that in the config, I think. No, I have a memory game in the config right now. This is an Uber Maven memory game, and it hits me for like 5,800. So, yeah, it. I might get to this setup, but this is. This is kind of maybe the target, not 100%, but this is a maybe target for end to end to end league. But I would say for now, I'll link this POB. I think the Adorn setup is real strong, just because, like, this, like I said, doesn't even have implicits. Just getting all these different sources of, like, ailment immunities for free is kind of cool. And then, like I said, you can drop one point here for a 96 tree or one, one jewel or whatever, and then, like, use the imp points as floaters. But, yeah. This is a little bit different than how it was in Trial of the Ancestors last time I made the video, because we have uh, Lightning Conduit. Or a storm rain of the conduit. I would say this I'll, this is interchangeable with the regular storm rain. This is probably better for single target, and this is better if you have a low number of arrows, especially or like a low attack speed. There is a scenario in like a super end gain setup where you have so many arrows, like you have a corrupt plus one quiver, and you have like you know some crazy attack speed multiplier and some crazy trigger rate where you can actually get so many that the other storm rain is actually better. 
I would say for most of the time you're going to be f having fun using level 18 storm rain. It's 18 because it's a spend breakpoint. 19 gains a, a spend cost from 10 to 11. And that hits a shot ratio cost. That's getting a little more into the weeds. If you, uh, if, if I wanted all the details on shot ratios and spend breakpoints, it'd be a two hour video. But if you're, you're welcome to ask questions, if you want more info on that or, you know, join the discord, whatever. But that's the overview of a build that just gets incredibly stupid numbers while still being really good at clear speed. Uh, if any mana build tries to get stronger, it will eventually arrive at Mana Forged Arrows. Uh, I'll see you guys for League launch. Hopefully this is what, what my character looks like in two weeks. Catch you next time.